Welcome to this podcast review for August 13th, 2024, and I'm Jada Duran. And I'm Brendan Cassidy. Hey, thanks for joining us for this conversation, everybody. Brendan, yeah. let me pose this question to you. We have traveled back in time in our DeLorean. The year is 2008. Where are you? <laughs> Well, specifically given this movie setting that we're about to talk about, it's the summer of 2008. Yeah. I just graduated high school. I was about to oh start my college. Gosh. This was a turning point for me in many ways. Much like okay. Didi himself, this was a turning point for me just in a very different context. Well, you know what's really funny about that? As we'll talk about in this film for mm -hmm. Didi, he is transitioning into high school yeah after graduating from middle school brendan in 2008 is graduating from high school while i am graduating from college and transitioning into the the adulthood. way you described that made it sound like a three generational movie remember that movie yeah, yeah. shaft when all three versions of shaft <laughs> that's what i was just thinking of that's kind of i just <laughs> That's a, a crazy irony that one yeah. is transitioning into high school, one's transitioning into college, one graduates from college. And we didn't plan that. Daughter. We did not plan that. No, whatsoever. we did not. That's wild. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Really fascinating. So, yeah. yeah, this is the transitional episode of In Session Film. It, clearly, all three of us transitioning in one way or another. I am yeah. really looking forward to talking about this film. This premiered at Sundance yeah. earlier in the year where it won the audience award for U.S. Dramatic. Uh, and, and I think it also won the ensemble as well. It won the special jury prize, if I'm not mistaken, too. Yes. Yeah, yes. For, for yes. that was the ensemble award that you're talking about. Yes, the special jury ensemble and the audience award. For yeah. us dramatic yep so yeah this is a film i've been looking forward to all year i didn't really know too much about it beyond its success at sundance it's this mm -hmm. coming of age film that's really all that i knew i didn't really watch the trailer all that much either i know it played in yeah. front of a few films that i saw but i don't pay attention to trailers most of the yeah. time <laughs> this one i kind of avoided too because i feel like more times than not, trailers for coming-of-age films tend to mismarket their films in a lot of ways. I feel like they yeah. have a certain they, – they always go for a certain tone that's really all about getting people into the theater, and the movie ends up being something very different. Uh, they yeah. usually upsell the comedy, and they undersell the sweetness <laughs> of a lot of those films. And I, I still have not seen the trailer for Dee Dee, but given the final product, I wouldn't be surprised if the marketing was more – focused on the vulgarity of this film that we'll talk about. Yeah, that's interesting. I'd be curious to go back and look at the trailer in hindsight because I honestly do not know. Yeah. Uh, and maybe that is what it tries to emphasize. I'm not exactly I don't know. sure. It, it's hard to market these films right because it, you, you always find yourself thinking of other movies that may have done the coming of age thing, even recently or back in the day. I mean, I, I could only imagine the marketing for this film reminding me of something like Skate Kitchen or mid 90s. Sure. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. So, yeah I, and and I'm, there are definitely, uh, you know, similarities you could probably draw between those films. But for reasons we'll get into, I think Dee Dee has a bit of a unique perspective uh, yes. that allows yeah. it to stand out. Absolutely. So, yeah, I've been looking forward to this film. I am very excited to get into it. So, Brendan, if you're ready, I think we can go ahead and jump on in. Okay. This is a debut film from Sean Wang, and mm -hmm. it stars Isaac Wang, Shirley Chen, Joanne Chen, and a bunch of others that come and go throughout the film. If you're not familiar with Dee Dee, in, as we noted, 2008, during the last month of summer before high school begins, an impressionable 13-year-old Taiwanese-American boy 
learns what his family can't teach him, how to skate, how to flirt, and how to love your mom. <laughs> I actually didn't go on IMDb to look at this. Is that really the plot synopsis? Yeah, that's what it says. Okay. That's it's what it says. <laughs> it's wildly specific, and that's it certainly is. not that's not wrong. No. <laughs> but I, I don't no. know if it's the best summation of this movie. There's more to it. Yeah, there's yeah. certainly more to it, but <laughs> I like it how is I like how incorrect. It, no, it's not wrong. You're right. It's it, but it seems to only gravitate towards a few specific things when this movie is certainly more all encompassing than just that. There's a For lot. Sure. I mean, I feel like I, many coming of age films have much broader uh, plot synopses when you go on IMDb, which I think are yeah. good to do. Uh, so that's weird that it focuses on a few particular points yeah. uh, to, to market this one. Absolutely. And before we get into it, I quickly want to note because we won't spend any time on it. There are a couple of cameos here that we hear vocally. We don't see them on screen, but we hear their voices and that's one spike Jones mm-hmm. who, I love that he has a little role here. That yeah, he's he's referenced field, in the movie but, too, which I thought was great. Yeah, it's amazing. And Stephanie Sue also has yeah. a vocal cameo here, which I thought was really fascinating as well. Yeah, yeah um, for sure. You know, it's interesting that Spike Jones is referenced here. He has a cameo. It might not be what you think of walking in. That might not be a name you associate with this film. Once you see right. it you could understand why Spike Jones would be a part of this. <laughs> there yeah, are certainly, yeah. <laughs> it has Spike Jones qualities. I'll just put it that way. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, all right, let's jump into it. Brendan, what did you think about Dee Dee? Well, I think it's also worth noting a few things. So you mentioned that this was Sean Wong's debut film. It's actually his debut narrative feature film specifically because he did get a little bit of attention for – a, a short documentary that he directed in 2023 called Nene and Waypo. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I know it was nominated for Best Documentary Short Film at the 96th Academy Awards. Uh, and I know it's ap- apparently available on Hulu and Disney Plus right now. It may have premiered at South by Southwest, where it garnered some awards recognition prior to its further nominations at the uh, at the Oscars there. So I, I at least heard of this filmmaker's name and you could tell that there was a personal a passion for a story like this, not just with that documentary, but also here with Dee Dee, the fact that his real life grandmother is actually playing the Nene uh, character here. If I remember that correctly, she's a riot just to throw that out there. (laughs) She's great. She's great. Very old fashioned, very protective um, in ways that we tend to see a lot of, you know, culturally specific coming of age films uh emulating you know th- while this isn't a korean family this is a taiwanese american family i did get some minari vibes a little bit so they're like, like like i know that's a different cultural comparison but it's also a very personal story for lee isaac chung in that regard and Dee is yeah. i'm glad i did not see the marketing here because i did not expect this to be nearly as vulgar as it was uh it is it, it's the movie's got a potty mouth <laughs> It really does, and it's, it's clear that Sean Wong is very much influenced by, and I think he's even spoken about this, he's influenced by movies like Stand By Me and trying to showcase both the uh, vulnerabilities but also the uh, the, the trash-talky nature of children that we sometimes shy away from because that is actually a thing, and he wanted to emulate that here, especially in the year 2008. <laughs> I, I don't know about you, J.D. When I was in high school, I heard kids talk this way. Uh, it's it, I, 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 it, it's an interesting way to portray it. And what I think makes this coming-of-age film special when compared to so many of its other contemporaries, because it's not reinventing the wheel. It's doing a lot of similar things that we've seen many of these films do. But this one really is focused on the when of it all and not just the what uh the when is so crucial here not just the 2008 backdrop and the way it utilizes myspace and aol instant messenger sometimes recreating an almost five minute sequence of just a kid surfing about myspace and facebook and how google and youtube look back in the day the recreation of that is incredible Mm -hmm. but i think the, the the thing here that really stuck out to me and where i even found some connectivity to this material it understands that that middle point that summer between eighth and ninth grade just before high school really is a key transitional moment for a lot of kids especially young boys Uh, and that really is that 
focal point here. It, in many ways, it's a time capsule coming of age film. And that was the thing that I really responded to the most and why I think it is one of my favorite films of the year. I recognize it's not reinventing any wheels, like I said, but I really enjoyed the heck out of this thing. And I love the conviction and the passion from Sean Wong here, too. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. I fell head over heels in, in love with this film. And it reminded me a lot of, and you threw out a bunch of titles there mm -hmm. that are certainly applicable to this film. What stood out to me the most, though, was Greta Gerwig's Lady Bird. That's what I was reminded okay. of okay. the most. I mean, this is similarly a debut film, as we noted, about a young person growing up in a specific mm -hmm. time and place and how that directly impacts their life and the choices they make. Uh, not to mention that this is the best movie since Lady Bird to capture what it was like to grow up in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Of course, Lady Bird was more the early part of the decade, whereas this film takes place in the latter half of the decade. But still, the authenticity mm -hmm. is stunning. The early Facebook culture, the instant messaging craze, the weirdness of early YouTube. It's all incredible here. But most of all, can you believe that MySpace actually let us rank our friends? Oh, In I hindsight, remember that. That is ridiculous. That is so, <laughs> that is so borderline ridiculous. sociopathic. I, I, I'm trying to remember back in the day when I had MySpace, I... I didn't really partake in the ranking of friends. I think I was able to pick like eight or 12 or 16 friends or whatever, whatever that group of four was. You can actually limit to what that uh, variable of four was. But I always put like some of my favorite bands at the time as my top friends. So that way I can avoid the, uh, you know, the idea of ranking friends. But you're right. There are that's a that's a sad and creepy concept that some it's children crazy. perhaps took up took a part of. It's absolutely ridiculous, but I love how that's not just a walk down memory lane here. That's an actual dramatic through line in this yeah. film. There is yeah. a point where Chris, after a moment of conflict with one of his friends, goes to MySpace to look to see how or if his friend had changed his ranking. And we mm -hmm. do see his reaction to it. And yeah. man, that is all too real, <laughs> all yeah. too palpable. Yeah. But I loved that about this film and how it utilizes a specific time and place to say something about growing up in an era where all of this technology was fairly new. And while it is yeah. often funny and awkward and charming, as most coming-of-age films tend to be, it slowly unravels into something more doleful by the end in a way that reminded me of something like, and you invoked it earlier, which I find extremely fascinating, but mm -hmm. this did remind me of something like Stand By Me in yeah. that regard, in the sense that everything at the end of this film is different for Chris. We leave Chris on a bit of ambiguity. We don't know what his high school experience will be, but it's not going to be the same as it was before the summer of 2008. And I really mm -hmm. do love the examination of that here. Yeah, you make a great point there that this is just not about, or this is not just about that transitional point when a young boy is at this certain age and he's starting to realize how maybe sheltered that he was. And in, in this case, maybe culturally sheltered and how that results in you changing your friends groups, experimenting with different friend groups. And that certainly is part of it, but you make a great point that the early stages of this technological boom, the early stages of the social media boom that em envelops all of our lives nowadays that's a huge part of this narrative. Like that really mm -hmm. is in many ways kind of a plot point uh, and it doesn't treat it like a plot point, which is pretty interesting. So it might go unnoticed to the average viewer, but I I'm with you. I sat there relishing in not just the nostalgia of flip phones. And I think <laughs> young actor, um, uh, uh, what, uh, Isaac, Isaac Wan, I believe his name is who yeah. plays our central figure here in interviews. I think he even said, you know, these utilizations of flip phones, it was like foreign technology to me. <laughs> I think he said like, the idea that in order to create or, or send a certain text, you had to click a number three times to get to the right letter. Uh, he like, that's such a foreign concept utilizing the natural dial of a phone to actually send yeah. a text message. Yeah. Um, but like the early stages of that social media boom, does create this new 
and very alien like way of communicating with your friends at that time. And it becomes interwoven within the narrative without treating it like a conflict or a plot point. It's all there indirectly. And I think that's a really smart way of going about it. So it works in both ways. It's very nostalgic and sweet in one way, but then it be, it, it, all, it weirdly showcases the dangers of that without it really being a movie about the quote unquote dangers of social media. It's not that direct about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I found that really interesting as well. Yeah, I completely agree. I think what's so compelling and striking about this film is how it's able to weave so much nuance here thematically emotionally dramatically and it all feel of a piece and yeah. that to me for me is why this film will likely rank as at least at this point one of my favorite films of the year and i think sure. ultimately this is where people will either cling to the depths of this film or they might have an issue. I, I found it all incredible when mm -hmm. you look at uh, the strained relationship with his sister, how that yeah. evolves over the course of the summer. It's about the relationship with his mom. And like most teenagers, he just feels like she's breathing down his neck. He just doesn't mm -hmm. understand the challenges of essentially her being a single mother who had to give up her dreams to take care of her children yeah. in the U S after moving there from Taiwan, which speaking of is why he is fatherless here. We yeah. never see or hear from him at any point in this film. All we know is that he is working in Taiwan. There's more than enough here simply on that front to examine Chris and how he sees himself in his own family or how being Taiwanese in America murkies the waters for him, such as the moment yeah. when Maddie says while on their date, you're cute for being quote unquote Asian and his response to that comment. There's also the subtle yeah. vivid shot of the skateboarder kids who come over to Chris's house to watch some videos and Sean Wang lingers on the kids' shoes, which they do not take off as they yep. enter the home. And yep, little insert shots. We Love see those things. Chris in the background with his socks on to offer that contrast, that cultural contrast. There's also the dynamic of Chris's mom signing him up for tutor lessons after yeah. a friend of hers brags about all the things her son had accomplished. Mm -hmm. Again, that alone is a thesis here. But then there's the whole coming of age aspect to his story as well. For as much as it's about Chris and his identity, it's about the struggle of friendship and belonging. It's about his loneliness and his inability to express his emotion. It's about the fear of talking to girls and the constant embarrassment yeah. you feel when trying to date. It's about the incessant feeling of shame, whether it be toward yourself and how you feel like you've messed everything up or perhaps toward your parents and how you feel as if you've failed to live up to their expectations. Somehow this film is able to explore all of that in 90 minutes without feeling bloated thematically or overstuffed narratively. There's a precision to way yeah. storytelling that I find remarkably impressive. The editing is sublime. The pacing is excellent. Both of those things are important here as well. I, mm. I just feel like the emotion we, and the themes of this film are fully realized given all of that. And I, I, I was blown away. Yeah. Yeah. We, we talk about this a lot to the point that it might start to sound tiring for a lot of our active listeners who have been with us for many years, but we often talk about why we love culturally specific stories, whether they be coming of age stories or whatever it might be that still are able to find some, sense of universality to them right mm -hmm. i mean I, I for those watching on youtube i think you might be able to notice jd and i are not taiwanese <laughs> so we cannot relate to the specif the, the 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 specifics of this particular story in this particular family and yet we can you know it, it, it's it, it, it it's all of that it's it's one of those yeah. cases if you were to switch this exact story out with maybe a different demographic 
it doesn't change yeah. the film, but it also does change the film. It's yeah. it, it's it, it gets it to does, have its it, cake and eat it too. It's broad enough that you can insert your self mm -hmm. into Chris, especially if you grew up during this era. Yeah, as you and I sort of did. We're obviously a yeah. little bit older than Wang, but there's enough yeah. where we can relate with him. But mm -hmm. it's also specific enough that it's Chris's story. It's yeah. Sean's story. It's those that are Taiwanese that grow up in America. And at that it's, time specifically, which we'll go yeah. back to that because that is important to your notion yeah. earlier. But yes, it has the specificity, but it's also broad. Like it, 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 it it's, it's, it's successful that, on both fronts. I think that, I, and I feel like that's that's how we have to sometimes grade movies like this, these coming of age films, and especially those that are from a particular point of view and perspective. It's how well they're able to straddle that line and have it both ways, as you're talking about. Can it go too yeah. broad, or can it go too specific? And in some cases, you might need to go a bit more specific, given maybe the. Uh, emotional context if there's maybe some more sociopolitical ramifications of the story it's telling then maybe going a bit more specific yeah. is a requirement but in this case finding that middle ground it's about where you can find that middle ground to have it both ways as evenly as possible and this one does a really good job at that uh, that yeah. that tug of war is never felt i never felt like this was trying to please two different audiences at different por at, at different pockets of the film. Like this could have yeah. easily went down the route of something like super bad. And for a while I was thinking about that movie early on as I was starting to relish in the vulgarity of it, I, I, which I did okay. not expect. As I said, I, I mean, thought to myself, man, referenced in the film. Well, so that's what I was getting to. Yeah. I, I was thinking to myself, man, I wonder if this is going to go the super bad route. And then literally three minutes later, they're all at a party and they're watching the movie super bad. And I guess it made sense because that came out in 2008. At least I think yeah. it did 2007, 2008, somewhere around, around that, time that time frame. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, actually, I think it was 2007, which means of course these kids would have been renting it probably for the wrong reasons when they shouldn't have been yeah, uh, they when were their parents aren't around. Home, so yeah, they were. Yeah. That. And I think their parents weren't around. So they were of course sneaking in a very bad R rated film and they're all what 13, 14 years old around <laughs> this time. Um, yeah. So <laughs> I, I, I thought that was a neat little, neat little tie in there. Uh, but yeah, it, it does. The film does a really good job straddling that line to be all encompassing and, and welcoming for everyone here. Yeah. And I found a relatability here, even though I I'm not part of that specific demographic. I think yeah. that's a great thing. I felt like I wanted to learn something from it simultaneously. Yeah. Absolutely. And that to me is why the film works. I could understand if some audiences wanted the film to be more specific with its cultural references and its family dynamic, or perhaps mm -hmm. lean more into its, broad appeal and pick a lane. Yeah. I, for one, am glad that Sean Wang decides to straddle that line. And I think he does yeah. so assiduously. And I do think it matters that he does attempt to straddle that line because so much of this film is about Chris having to grapple with his family, his identity as it relates to being a Taiwanese American Mm -hmm. And him trying to find out who he is in California, in his city, in his school. Yeah, it, it on is one both hand, that's of a, those things simultaneously. It, it, it's exactly that, but it's also just about that time when a young boy just simply doesn't know how to be cool yet. <laughs> just yeah. he, you can take yeah, it as very broadly. Awkward. As, he's very yeah. awkward. Yeah, but that's definitely part of it too. Well, and I think that's what I love so much about the writing of this film and especially where this film ends again, that stand by me esque maturity it's where very bittersweet. It's, it, it feels very yes. dangly. I love that. And I, and I love that because Sean Wang is unrelenting as it relates to the writing of Chris and the decisions he makes throughout the film. Chris makes a ton of mistakes here. Some of it mm -hmm. is growing up and being juvenile for sure. Some of it is Chris being a product of the time, being a product of his specific and mm -hmm. cultural circumstances. However, I think the film does a great job of exhibiting duality in all of that. The skateboarder kids aside, because mm -hmm. let's be honest, the way Chris treated his mom in that moment when they come over to the house was pretty questionable. Horrible. Yeah, yeah. But his date with 
Maddie, for example, is it understandable that he'd get nervous? Absolutely. Yeah. Was she maybe a little presumptuous on a first date? Yes, but the intent was not malicious, and she tried mm-hmm. talking to him after the fact. Him ignoring yeah. her is what becomes more of the, the problem. There, yeah. same thing with his friend Fahad yeah. leaving Chris to go to this party with two girls was not very kind. Did no, Chris he, he, need to? Yeah, he's not just a victim here. He's a culprit in many ways. Yeah, exactly. Did Chris yeah. need to return the favor, so to speak? Maybe not, but even so, Mm -hmm. there was a lack of communication between those two characters. So I do think there's great duality throughout this film that, yes, he makes mistakes, but you can certainly argue that he's as much a victim in all of that. And I love that about the film Mm -hmm. uh, is that in all of these things, it becomes a catalyst for change for Chris. So mm-hmm. in those final scenes, he has his moment with Maddie. He has a final nod with Fahad. And what it suggests is that this is a turning of the page for Chris. Yeah. That life has these chapters. And for Chris, he's moving into a new one that likely will not involve it's, Maddie or Fahad. And it, there's yeah, a wisdom to that. Yeah. That I, I, I just find exquisite it, here. I mean, it could still involve them. There's still like a minor acknowledgement. Well, that's what I love about the film. And I hate making too many comparisons here because we've already done quite a bit already. But it's it's the same reason why I love so many of Richard Linklater's films, especially his coming of age films like Dazed and Confused and Everybody Wants Some. And while they're not coming of age films per se, but even something like Before Sunrise is the way he leaves threads dangling. It leaves you with this question, oh, what happens next? I want to know what happens next. And some people might find that frustrating and a little bit unfulfilling, but I love that about this film in particular is that it left me with that sensation. Lady Bird's another example that does that. It leaves you with this question, what happens next? Is there a reconciliation of sorts or is this a completely new turning point for Chris and maybe him – joining a new click as time goes on is this just yeah. like like you said it's just that there's turning a great point. ambiguity there yeah, yeah. And, and, yeah. And, I, and and i and it's one of those cases where it's like i i want to see what comes next for chris i really do but i don't want to see a sequel or i don't want to see what yeah. comes next you know, exactly. the unknowing is the charm of that of this movie and i yeah. i love movies that do that especially with regard to adolescence because that is so crucial the what if is so important to that journey and i and this movie recognizes that a- absolutely and i think part of the gravitas of that change it's not just his approach to maddie and fahad but mm-hmm. you think about his sister and the bickering mm-hmm. that they embody early on in the film which every one with a sibling will relate to significantly yeah. For sure. Certainly for took sure. me back to the early 2000s, for sure. Uh, yep. I had a younger sister. So, yeah, we and we were only a year and a half yeah. apart. So we were even t- we were even closer in age. Yeah. There was a lot more bickering there. But there comes a great moment in this film. And honestly, it took me aback emotionally. There's a moment in this film where Chris's sister has this epiphany mm-hmm. that her relationship with Chris is about to change forever because she is leaving for college. And in a moment of that bickering conflict, Chris simply reiterates in a moment of frustration, I hope to never see you again. Yeah. And you start to see her have this sudden change of heart. And it unexpectedly hit me kind of hard because I do remember vividly to be vulnerable here for a moment. And I don't think I've ever expressed this to my brother or sister. So if they're listening, surprise. That's sweet. That's sweet. I get (laughs) get to hear it first, everybody. (laughs) But there was a moment during my freshman year of college early on. And I think a lot of freshmen when they leave home for the first time have these moments of catharsis. Mm Mm-hmm. But during the fall semester of my freshman year, so I'm at school for a couple of months 
maybe. And you you have this epiphany that your life has changed forever, that you're not going back home, you're not going to live the life that mm-hmm. was your childhood for 18 years. And yes, with your siblings, there's always some volatility there, but there is something so heavy about the idea of, oh, I'm never going back to that. Yeah. I'm never going to have that same relationship as we did as, as kids. And I remember sitting in my dorm room, finally having that realization and I utterly broke down. Mm, uh, just thinking like okay. having like a waft of memories, just just slay me, you know, with regarding mm-hmm. my brother yeah. and my sister and um and knowing that I'm never going to get that again mm-hmm. um uh, because you have turned this corner. You've you've yeah. turned this page. And you get that with Chris's sister. Like she has this epiphany, "Oh, I'm never going to have these moments with him ever again once I leave." And hearing him yeah. say I don't ever want to see you again in this moment of frustration that she knows is simply born out of that and, and nothing mm-hmm. more. Yeah. It completely changes the way she treats him throughout this film. And I, I responded to that way more heavily than I ever anticipated, but that like that, and we can certainly well, talk about his mom as well, but like those elements also carry weight in those final scenes as far as Chris and well, finally becoming yeah. something new at the end. Well, that relationship between Chris and his older sister when she does leave for college, I feel like in any other movie like this, especially in the hands of a less efficient storyteller and a less skilled storyteller, would try to find a way to crystallize that arc. And it would have seemed a bit too sudden, a bit too quick, a bit too unrealistic to have that kind of rift resolve itself. And then all of a sudden by the end, Hey, just a few weeks later, we're the happiest of brother and sister. Now, uh, this is a movie that recognizes there's still a ways to go for that relationship. Uh, it's, it, it it is, as we keep talking about, it's that starting point. It's this movie is all about that particular pivot point in the transitions of these relationships and the, uh, the initial recognition of where this could end up for the better as time goes on. That's really all that is. And the film does understand that, which is why it's another thread that's sort of left dangling when she does leave for college. It, it it feels very unfulfilling in a way that I think serves this movie. I I don't say that as a negative. When I say unfulfilling, I actually mean that as a positive here uh, because it feels like something still left dangling for us. uh, And it, it, to your point, there is that relatability for those of us that, Maybe we're the older sibling. Maybe we're the younger sibling. So there comes a point where we do go off to college, if we choose to go to college, that is, and we have that newly formed distance between our family members, especially mm-hmm. those that were closer to us in age. And I've related to that, too, when I left for college and my sister was still a uh, 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 a senior in high school. So like, I know what that's like, too. And it's it's very real. And this movie understands mm-hmm. how real that it is. And I love that the film gives a moment to both of them to relish in the recognition of the significance of that change. Yeah. Obviously for his sister, it's much more abundant. We see her have this dramatic it's more direct. Yeah. change in, in how she treats him throughout the rest of the film until she leaves for college. Yeah. And those moments are tender and beautiful. And I love yeah. that. And as again, as someone who can relate with that, as many of us can relate with that, I do love how the film treats her in those moments. For Chris, it's a little bit more subtle, but I do love that moment yeah. immediately after she leaves. And the goodbye itself is perhaps a little uneventful, we'll say. They do have an embrace, but it's uneventful. Yeah. Where that moment thrives is in the immediate aftermath when there's a shot of Chris walking into her empty bedroom, mm-hmm. staring at the empty walls, looking at the ceiling Yeah, where he realizes, Oh, this is real. This is real. Yeah. This is different now. Yeah. Because up Incredible until that moment. point, it's more about his 
confusion in the matter. It, like, yeah. like this whole this whole new experience he's having with his sister right now, it's so foreign to him because that wasn't really the basis of their relationship during this time. Uh, and I, I love the way that crystallizes. You're absolutely right. That's a really sweet yeah. and tender moment. And it, but but it goes for the heartstrings in a very non Hollywood way. Yeah, it's uh, not sentimental. Like there's yeah. a realness to that. Yeah. Uh, that I think is handled beautifully in the writing and the directing yeah. and Isaac I, Wing's performance as well. I, 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 oh yeah. We keep talking about him. We keep talking about Chris, at least as our main character, he really is great in this movie, really quite yeah. terrific in a, in a young performance here. Um, but I do love that moment as well because it, it certainly understands the, uh, uh, the way you can convey catharsis in the movie that doesn't just mean you're full on crying your eyes out. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. catharsis can be a bit more, it could it could be driven more by gestures and movements, and that's definitely a hard thing to do. And Chris certainly conveys that, or Isaac certainly yeah. conveys that for sure. Absolutely, and that I think is a big part of Chris's through line here, as well as the relationship he has with his mom, played by mm -hmm. Joan Chen in this film. And I do love what this film offers her. It's the role isn't quite as it's not quite as significant as something like Lady Bird, for example, where that is such a it, you know such a vital relationship in that film. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris's mom here is it doesn't have as much screen time, but I would say that the relationship is equally as important. And I do love that we get these details that allow us to you know, sink our teeth into the character that gives mm -hmm. more emotional weight to the yeah. film. We uh, see just how much she sacrifices for her kids, even though they don't really appreciate it. She's stuck in this thankless role. She wants to be an artist, maybe could have been great if she committed to it, but mm -hmm. again, had the sacrifice that yeah. for her kids, there's this absolutely heartbreaking moment in the film when she submits a painting for this art competition only to get rejected and it's like you're really good painting. Shot is, <laughs> it, it's really moving or as we noted earlier the scene of chris yelling at her in front of the skateboarder kids is devastating to see her her reaction to that yeah. um, and and how taken aback she is she never wavers in her love for chris even though he does little to recognize her sacrifice and love. She's the unsung hero in many regards and how that crystallizes at the end of this film. Those last moments they have together, I think are, are really incredible. So yeah. when you couple that with Chris's relationship with his sister, as we just talked about and his coming of age outside of the home, as it relates to his experiences with Fahad, with, Maddie with the skateboarder kids, all of that compounds. Again, there's so many different through lines here, but I think it's seamlessly woven together. Mm -hmm. That that those final shots, that final transition, in in the ambiguity that's there. You're right as to the what we discussed earlier. Who knows where Chris's story is going to go? But it does feel yeah. as if Chris found something, whatever it is. There's something yeah. for him to grab onto as he turns that page. He's still just 14 years old or 15 years old, or however he is as a freshman going into high school. Um, and there's a lot that he'll still learn over the next four years. But I, I just love that from the beginning of this film to the end, there is something concrete for him as it relates to what yeah. his identity might be. Yeah, and that relationship with his mom is great. It's this might sound like a weird way of saying it. Um sh at times she is not the best mom. She makes a lot of mistakes, but that's also what makes her the best mom, right? Uh it, it, it's that because there is a recognition of that that she has this unrelenting pressure to be there for her family while her husband is off making money for the family. And that's where this yeah. culturally specific side of the movie comes into the mm -hmm. forefront more than anything else. It, it, like the idea that the breadwinner has to be there making the money to keep them alive while she's there tending to the home. She even says at one point, 
I'm the one that makes this a house. I think she says yeah, to that's a great um, Nene here, yeah. which, which is a great line. But she does make a lot of mistakes because of that unrelenting pressure. Like she, she tries to set her kids up for success, sometimes not really recognizing that it is the thing that they want or not, uh, such mm-hmm. as that dinner scene with her friend who's bragging about their yeah. own kid and the grades that he has and the sports that he plays. And she doesn't really have much to say about Chris outside of, oh, he does a little bit of filming he, and stuff. So skates. then they have to say, oh, he's, <laughs> what she oh says. Yeah, yeah. She, he skates. It's like, oh, he also does some filming. Then they say, oh, like on Lee. And so they have to yeah. draw a comparison to a great filmmaker in order to justify <laughs> him doing great work. And then yeah. she rolls with that and rolls him into tutoring where the kids are still not nice to him and doesn't really think about it in that way. I, I was looking at the trivia here. Apparently a nice little tidbit here is that when uh, uh, Joan, the actress, references little Ang Lee, jo, uh, I, apparently she also worked with Ang Lee on a film before. So I thought that was great. I think it was less caution specifically. So I love the little in-joke there if that was meant to be one. Um, yeah. but, but she has to upsell his skills a yeah. little bit. Uh, almost and, as, oh, like they're trying to find bragging rights yeah. for him. Yeah, no, that's a really great moment in this film as well. And yeah, that is certainly an aspect of the film I found interesting for both Chris and his mom. And as it relates to the reference specifically to Ang Lee, I love the contrast to what the film reveals later on as it relates to Chris's cinematography skills, which Mm. let's just say is it's a far cry from the film's something <laughs> the far cry from Spike Jones as well. Yeah, yeah, it's just it's a great little revelation in this film that heightens that moment uh, in hindsight. Yeah, I mean, really yeah, stuff. and and of course the cut away from Ang Lee uh, features a moment of magical realism involving a talking fish, and I half expected yeah. a tiger to oh just come gosh. out of the out of, yeah. <laughs> just eat it up. Yeah, there's two scenes of magical realism in this film, hence the cameos we mentioned earlier, I guess. I get, yeah, I, I don't even them. know if I want to call them magical realism. They're so silly and so weird yeah. that it's almost beyond <laughs> description. I love there, it, though. There's, I mean, there are two moments in particular involving a squirrel, I'll simply say, yeah. that had me in stitches. I've never yeah. seen anything like that. I did not know the film was going to be that yeah that brazen with this kind of story <laughs> yeah there the the moment that involves spike jones's cameo i'll say that use of magical realism makes sense given the state of mind of chris i'll say the one at the dinner table with the fish is it's simply out of nowhere that's <laughs> like, a, I, I, but i love it like i think that may have been the sudden turn i think that may have been the first moment of that so it did seem almost random at times. So thankfully the movie at least has a purpose yeah. in how it utilizes that. It does it a little bit more often. There, so that, yeah, there's a couple yeah. more times. So, so it's at yeah. least a little bit consistent. And yeah, you yeah. know, with the Spike Jones cameo, I couldn't help but think, okay, now we're getting a little, you know, a little being John Malkovich here, I guess. <laughs> yeah, a little bit of that. Yeah. 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 Uh yeah, no, I yeah, I loved all of that. And how like we're talking a lot about the thematic nuance of this film and Mm -hmm. the relationships that Chris has and how that ultimately leads to this bittersweet ending where Chris turns the page and finds something to stand on. Even if it's Mm -hmm. not much, it does feel like a page has turned for Chris. And I love that about this film. Again, it reminded me of stand by me. Not, it doesn't quite have the same stakes, but still it feels like there's some, there's substance for Chris that Mm -hmm. leaves him in a new place than where we met him at the beginning of this film. And those are often the best coming of age films, I think, but I don't want it to be forgotten that this film is absolutely hysterical at times. It is very funny. I love the awkwardness of the film. Uh, A lot of the humor is, it is straight out of 2008. The dialogue, the way these kids act. Oh my gosh! Yeah, Where, where's Vince Vaughn when you need him? Because he keeps talking about how we don't have enough raunchy comedies anymore. He needs to watch yeah. this movie. I know. <laughs> well, and what's great about the writing here as well is that it's not movie-ish. It's not manufactured. That's true. Yeah. Look, and we just got done talking about this 
with M. Night Shyamalan and Trap and how he contrives everything. But that's his trademark. Because it's a movie. <laughs> and that's him. Like, I love that about M. Night. So I'm not saying this as, oh, Sean Wang and his writing is so much better. Oh, it's like M. Night needs to be more like Sean Wong. <laughs> no. <laughs> Stick to what works for you is yeah. ultimately what I'm trying to say. But I do love that this avoids the traps of manufactured dialogue and it feels natural, especially because of how some of these kids act. And, you know, when you're 12, 13 years old, there is a juvenile nature mm -hmm. to your behavior at that time. Yeah. And that comes through in a really authentic, stirring way here that I absolutely love. Like there's an abrasiveness it's to these characters that I think are, that's really great. It's funny, yeah. It's it's it, yeah. It, a lot of the a lot of the great humor here also involves his mom, which I thought was pretty surprising. There's a moment in a car involving a fart. Oh yes, <laughs> that was unexpected as well. I just yeah. like I was writing a few notes down. I just simply wrote down "mommy fart" just so I wouldn't forget <laughs> that. <laughs> so good. Yeah, did not anticipate that at all. But yeah, again, that's that natural realness that movies don't often depict. How? When was the last time you saw that in a film that wasn't um, like overly like stylized for comedic sake? Yeah, yeah. But, but we've. But I'm sure many families have had conversations like that before. Oh yeah, it's it's it's, it's documentary sure. like without feeling like a documentary. So I guess yes. it's no surprise that Sean Wong certainly. You know, he came from making a short documentary that was inspired by his own family. So he's allowing that to bleed into this film. And it does feel authentic in that way. I completely agree. Another moment of authenticity in this film that just <laughs> similar to the MySpace thing. There's a moment where Chris tells one of his friends, I need you to call me in a minute. And he mm -hmm, walks mm -hmm. into the house next to the girl he likes, waiting for his ringtone to go off because he's <laughs> yeah because it's to... it's because he knows it's a band that she likes. I think his ringtone <laughs> may have been either I think it was Paramore because the the band Paramore is all over this movie. Anyone who grew up in the early two thousands to mid two thousands has done exactly that move. Oh yeah. You in look one for way an or another, end. you we've you all done end. it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you look for an end because God forbid you start the conversation yourself. We can't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. You want oh, to God. show off the ringtone at, at that time because it was all new and it, it was all starting to become custom. I mean I guess by 2008 may, maybe the iPhone craze had started to take over. But mm -hmm. especially in the early to mid 2000s when I was in high school, mm -hmm. man, that was a move everyone pulled off. And oh, yeah, yeah, it, I, it I was hilarious relate. seeing that in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> I, I did love the references to various forms of art and music. I mentioned the band Paramore here, although it was kind of a scary thing knowing that Haley Williams and the band are still making albums and they're still doing pretty good, doing more dance oriented rock nowadays. But if a younger audience sees this movie, is their reaction that, oh, that Paramore band, that's a good classic rock band. Are we at that point now? That's kind of a scary thing if that's the yeah. case. <laughs> yeah. I mean, when we were growing up, what did you think about music and films of the 70s? Didn't it feel ancient if someone in 1999 was like, oh, yeah, that movie from 1973? It kind of like, did, that yeah. Was like I, ago. I think of That's music at the at time. Now. I think of music at the time as classic rock. When I heard of bands like Led Zeppelin and Queen yeah. and Styx and many of those yeah. other examples. That's but what they then, played on the classic rock stations at that time. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I used to see classic rock as like a genre rather than a classification. Uh, yeah. But now, you know, I think back at my childhood and the in in the mid to late nineties bands like Pearl Jam and Nirvana were still kind of top of mind. But now is that classic rock? Like, has that become yeah. classic rock? I think it has. I think I, we can yeah. call that classic rock now. Classic rock is rock of the, we'll say mid nineties and early two thousands. And anything before is just ancient rock. I think that should be the new classic. So by that definition, <laughs> Creed is classic rock now. Oh my gosh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that was 30 years ago. Oh wow. gosh. Kill me now. <laughs> I know we're getting old. So I guess I got, I guess I got to tell people I play in a classic rock band now. 
Yeah, you're playing a classic <laughs> rock band. Anyway, DD is awesome. Great movie. Do you have any final thoughts on DD as we wind down here? No, I think everyone should see it. I don't often make recommendations for movies anymore because I just like to talk about how I react to it, and I recognize that not every movie is for every audience, but I think this is one that could be pretty accessible to a lot of people, and I hope people check it out. Yeah, I absolutely love this film. Absolutely adore it. It is one of my favorite films of the year so far, Mm -hmm. and... Maybe that's not a surprise given that I immediately thought of Lady Bird, which was my favorite film of 2017. I don't know if Dee Dee yeah, is yeah, that quite that decade. high yet, but it might be. I mean, I love this film a lot. and You know, of, of recent coming-of-age films, certainly in the um, you know the indie circuit, if you want to classify it in that way, I think of movies like not just Lady Bird, but also mid-90s, like I mentioned earlier, or Skate Kitchen, or... Maybe another example that I've seen floating around as a comparison is Bo Burnham's Eighth Grade. Yeah, uh, still in my thunder. Do, That's exactly where I was going next. I do think Dee Dee is one of the better ones of oh, that group. Hands that down, I don't even yeah. think that it's close. I would take yeah. Dee Dee maybe over all of those, except for Eighth Grade, which was in my top five. I want to say for its year, I'd have mm-hmm. to go back okay. to check that, but certainly in that conversation. If it's not in my top five, it's not too far from it. I yeah. absolutely love that film. Yeah, and- we, yeah, that would be a great topic for us to go back and look at some of the best coming-of-age films of maybe the past 10 years or something like that. And maybe yeah. we try and specifically focus on movies that fall into this more, I guess, literal classification of coming-of-age. Because you could yeah. be a bit, uh, I guess, creative with how you define that. I mean, in many ways, you could probably argue that Hayao Miyazaki's The Boy and the Heron is kind of a coming-of-age film. Uh, but it's not really the, the 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 textbook example of a coming of age film like this film is, or some of these other yeah. examples. But I think of that kind of classification, Dee Dee is one of the better ones we've gotten as of late. Yeah, and, and it's not even close as far as I'm concerned. I, I think it's okay. one of the best films of the year, period. Let alone coming of age or otherwise. Mm-hmm. And Lady Bird and Eighth Grade are certainly films that immediately came to mind. I thought of Lady Bird because of how it is about this specific time and place. And that is such a vital part to Lady Bird as well. For sure. That directly impacts Lady Bird's choices throughout that film. Similarly with Chris here, eighth grade has a lot in common as well, because that was a directorial debut as was Lady Bird for Greta Gerwig. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. with Kayla in eighth grade, a lot of it, invokes technology and how that is a part of the grow the growing up of today's adolescence. The difference for uh-huh. me, unless I am misremembering, so feel free to correct me if I am, but there is a distinction, a big distinction in the sense that I don't think there is a specificity to the time of eighth grade. Whereas we know mm-hmm. that this film takes place, Didi takes place in 2008. And yeah. we do see that vividly in the film, right? With early Facebook and not just the, like a, like a, a broad mockery of mm-hmm. Facebook and how it might have looked. It is to a T what Facebook looked like in 2008. This movie the details rec- on it, it are literally incredible. recreates it. It recreates, recreates it. it perfectly. Yeah. Ex- same thing with MySpace, Instant Messenger. You if you experienced all of that early YouTube, if you experienced any mm-hmm. of that, especially as a kid, it is going to take you to a very specific time did, and place. Did you ever have a Zanga? Remember that one, a Zanga Oh page? yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's Absolutely. the only thing missing from this one. <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, yeah. The, 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 like by 2008, I didn't quite have the MySpace anymore. I had let that mm-hmm. go, but okay. had the Facebook, of course, still had Instant Messenger, was on YouTube at that time as well. And about mm-hmm. a year later is when Twitter came to be about. And yeah. I was maybe a couple years after Twitter had came to prominence maybe 2010 is when I joined Twitter 2010, 2011, something like that. 
Yeah. Okay. So okay. that was that's just a few years away for Chris. <laughs> I know. Yeah. <laughs> that's a whole nother um, beast. <laughs> yeah. But I think uh, I, I think you're right. I think I recall eighth grade not being that specific in its setting or its time period. Yeah, it, it I do felt modern I, to well, it, it felt contemporary. Uh, yeah, I, very I, contemporary. Because I, I, I know yeah. social media had a play in that movie, but it felt maybe at worst a few years removed from when the film came out, uh, if that. Uh, but it still felt maybe like a modern depiction of social media at that time. So yeah, I, I, yeah that's so, how so, I saw yeah. it. Yeah. Again, unless I'm misremembering, but it felt like eighth grade depicted social media as it was in 2018 is, when that film is came this, out. Is this an unofficial trilogy of of time period coming of age films between Lady Bird and then technically <laughs> this one and then technically eighth grade? If you want to do it chronologically, as far as the time Perhaps. periods they're represented in, those uh, three Lady films Bird, are very yeah. connected. There's there's yeah. no doubt about it. There's a much further line between eighth grade and Lady Bird. But if yeah. you put Dee Dee right in the middle, it you get the triangle or you get you the do, perfect. You do, yeah. Because Lady Bird graph. was, that was the 90s, right? Or early 90s, I think it was. Early 2000s. Yeah. Early 2000s. Yeah, yeah I okay. talked about that in my opening thoughts. Er, like okay. Lady Bird is early 2000s and That's Dee right, Dee I had is the dad playing 2000s. solitaire. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> you get both ends of the spectrum as far as the 2000s yeah. go. So yeah, I think it's like 2003 in Lady okay. Bird and then you get 2008. So they're close enough in time that the technology isn't too different, but there's they still kind of are too. Like yeah. it's, it's like it, the, the, the closeness of those time periods actually makes DD even seem more sci-fi by comparison, yeah. because like, there was that moment in this time, 2008, 2007, whenever it was where there was like this huge boom in the way social media was treated uh at that time it was yeah. it was a huge shift it was almost sudden and almost kind of frightening uh and the, even though that's only what five years removed between Lady Bird and Dee Dee from a time period standpoint it seems much larger because yeah. of that that huge shift yeah and, and obviously Lady Bird is about four years older than where we pick up with Chris yeah. in this film yeah. Yeah. and also they're very different characters if you put Lady Bird into this time and place although both of them are in California, so it really is just the time gap. But if you put <laughs> Lady Bird into the film of Dee Dee, I don't know if much changes for her because she's the artistic, I'm not really controlled by technology. Like I, I could oh, see- no, she's, like, it does, she's, the, a, she's the hipster. She's, she's the, hipster. the hipster. She's yeah. the pretentious art person. <laughs> like she doesn't care about yeah. MySpace and instant messenger. Yeah. Like, She's oh, not going to be that, on those. Apps. That could have made an even better argument for an unofficial trilogy here, but I think eighth grade took place in New York, not California. Oh yeah, if I remember yeah. correctly. Yes, that so, is correct. Yeah, yeah. So I guess that kind of breaks it away a little bit. Sadly, I don't yeah. know. I, I. But they're there still very is connected. A, All three. There are, is are a connectivity sure. here. I mean, a, a lot of people might argue that Jonah Hill's mid nineties might make more sense here, but I don't think it really does. That's a, that's a, that's a much more directorially interesting movie that I don't think necessarily yeah. works as much. Like that was mm -hmm. more about Jonah Hill trying to flex some of his muscles within that setting. Um, yeah. Not in a bad way. It's just a very different movie by comparison to these three yeah. that we're talking about. Yeah. I don't think the quality is quite there. I love the experimentation and yeah. the loose storytelling of that film, even if mm -hmm. it's messy, that's yeah. where I find that film to be compelling. But I do think it is, yeah easily the lesser of the specific four that we're talking about. But sure. Yeah. I, I do think DD is one of the best coming of age films we've seen. And not just because of its specificities to 2008 and how great that is. I do love the vivid visuals that come with that. But again, uh -huh. it is the thematic nuance, the thematic story or the nuance storytelling of this film. When you're looking yeah. at, Chris and how he sees himself in his family with his mom, with his yeah. dad being fatherless, how all of that affects him in one way or another. And all of how him being Taiwanese in America, how that's a play yeah. throughout a lot of this film, how he has to react to, to that 
to things happening to him because of that. Yeah. Throughout this film. And, yeah, and just sure. the, the general being an adolescence and feeling like you don't belong. Feeling yeah. like you have completely messed everything up. Feeling mm-hmm. as if you have shamed yourself and your parents. And how do you cope with that? It's incredible how this film fits all of that here. Yeah. And 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 it finds a seamless middle ground and without it being messy and completely disjointed. It, it it's kind mm-hmm. of a miracle that this film is as great as it is, given everything that it's trying it's to do. It's really good. To toy it's with. a really good movie. Good stuff. Uh, I love it. Absolutely love it. I highly recommend it. Please see it as much as you can. Um, I, I think we'll go ahead and wind down here since we ended up getting into a rabbit hole here for final thoughts. But uh, sometimes, sometimes the movies we love hey, the most fun. make us just want to talk about other just things. Just want to talk. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So if you agree or disagree with anything we had to say here, please leave a comment if you're below, if you're watching on YouTube, if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, or Spotify, reach out to us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can email us in sessionfilm at gmail.com. Any final thoughts, Brennan, before we get out of here for this episode? I I, I really am wondering how this film is going to sit with me with regard to this year. Um, I I, I feel like this is a film I'm going to like more as time goes on because of that universality and i'm really curious to see what happens when i get this is one i can easily give a revisit to not just because it's only 90 minutes long it's a very brief film but movies like this really good coming of age films have this inherent rewatchability for me at least yeah. and i like i this is a movie i want to show people like i want to watch this with other people and get the reactions from and that's that's almost like the best compliment I can give it when I think about it is the, is like the fact that I want to show people this movie while I'm sitting there next to them experiencing it for the first time. Um, yeah. So that's my final thought. I feel like that's probably the best praise I can give it, honestly. Yeah, it's it's very, very good. I, I loved watching this in a theater, even if it was me and three others. We enjoyed yeah. it. All four of us <laughs> enjoyed you know, watching my, this. My theater was pretty full. Uh, but then oh, again, nice. I, I did see it at, I, I didn't see it at like a, um, like a like 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 a, like a high end Regal or AMC or any hot or any any well recognized brand like that. I saw it at the local art house theater, uh, the Bryn Mawr Film Institute specifically, which is sort of known for attracting the community that's interested in these types of films. Sure, 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 sure. Um, so yeah. it, it, it got a pretty good following that day, and it was it was a very engaging crowd. They were definitely with this movie. Good to hear. Good yeah. to hear. I wish that we had more indie theaters like that that were, are accessible to me. We have a few, but it's they're hard to get to for me. Are they probably I, like in the heart of Miami? This. Well, that or maybe like in Hollywood, which is not too far mm. from here, but parking's a nightmare. Gotcha. Uh, okay. You know, it's just, it, it's, they're difficult to get to uh, for mm. whatever reason. So I ended up seeing this at an AMC that's in a huge freaking mall in a very oh, crowded area. And that's and the worst place to see a movie us. like this. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. You know, it is funny because, you know, and I saw this on a Saturday night, so there are a gazillion people there, which Mm -hmm. in and of itself is exciting. You're walking into a movie theater and people are there to experience the cinema and it weirdly gets you emotional a little bit like, okay, people are having fun here. We're at church and there is worship galore and (laughs) you love seeing that. Yeah, There's just not as many people experiencing Didi, that's all. <laughs> You're just no, being not a few quite. others. So. Not quite. Um, at any rate. Good movie. Please go see it. Uh, with that, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on the In Session Film Podcast. Isaac Wing, awesome in the film. Probably should have known that earlier. Really good. Performance is great all around.